Bhutan, my aunt had bought uh, some ready-made Ansara processes from, uh, from Auntie Amina down the road, and we began to, while well, Muslims from India were classified as Indian. Concepts, understandings, and practices of marriage, childbearing, self-image, grief, etc., are all therefore influenced by these classifications. When looking at religion in the South African context, we often find that our lens is shaped by Christianity due to our colonial influence. But by spending time with my family in the southern suburbs of Cape Town, I had an immersive experience into the world of and practices of the Cape Malay people. This research led me to discover the existing intersectionality between the cultural and faith-based practices within my own family. Although the experience was in no way exhaustive, it offered enough of a way into the culture to assist in the facilitation of the discussion with the collaborative workshop theatre process. However daunting, this, uh, however daunting as this task felt, it was also an incredible exploratory endeavour in, as, as it most certainly developed an awe-inspiring respect for the stories of the women in the text. David? with the character Azra, elegantly threads a, a link between Cape Malay Islamic culture and Jordanian Arabic um, Islamic culture. This was important because when working with the text, there's a direct link made to the differences in Islamic religious practices in other parts of the world, such as Jordan, in comparison to those in South Africa. The text opens in Jordan with a violent scene of a young girl, Azra, being stoned to death. David is deliberate by, to show us the contrast in how and when the rules are enforced in Arabic nations and how and when they are enforced in South Africa. In the space between Jordan and Cape Town, David negoti negotiates what the veil means to Muslim women. She adopts dif a different attitude towards the veil and its value for women who wear it by representing this plurality of Muslim women's voices. This, the concern for each of the characters is about how the veil invokes a part of who they are. For some, it is the way in which they have learnt their religious self, sense of their religious sense of self, something that is naturalized to the point of non-questioning and acceptance. For others, it is a symbol of political consciousness and an identity to participate in actively and um, vigilantly. Perhaps the larger lesson on offer in the play one that uses its teaching and teaching aid as the theatrical space to elucidate the possibilities of performativity is to offer more than a reductionist reading of who you may be and what identity may possibly mean at any, any given moment. The, this performance is one of activity, of agency, of construction. And each one can, turn, can in turn inform the, the potential versions of identity represented to the audience. It acts as a challenge to, a, to politics of fear that wants, that, that wants the act of talking to identity and breaks down the homogenous, monolithic, and fixed ideas of who we see as us and them. So upon close reading of the text and assisted by other forms of research and discussion, we found that all five senses were powerfully evoked by David's text. Sand, spice, blood, song, fabric, all of these created the vivid, vivacious, and violent world of the play. Immersive theater is a form of theatrical performance that aims to create an immersive and participatory experience for the audience. This felt well suited to engage with the demands of the text, unlike traditional theater, where the audience typically sits in a designated area, like you today. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and observes the action on stage. Immersive theatre blurs the boundaries between performers and spectators, inviting the audience to actively engage and interact with the performance environment and the narrative itself. Hajj, or the idea of pilgrimage, is one of the five pillars of the Islamic faith. Followers are encouraged to go to Mecca at least once in their lives. We adopted this idea by encouraging audience members to walk through nine stage stations where they encounter the stories of six characters in the text. It is our hope that in some way, this journey or walk transforms them, um, and, and they see the complex and interesting lives of these women. At these stations, they discover Auntie Karima in her fragrant kitchen, 
Tahira in her racially charged office space, um, Aisha in the challenge safe space of her workshop painting protest signs, um, Zahra in the movie theater where she's exploring the power of her voice in the online world, as well as in the mind space and dreamscape of Azra's grieving mother, who during our process we gave the name Nawal, which in Ar Arabic means state or quality of being kind, an act of kindness beyond what is due. And Azra, a constant specter, haunting the audience and the performers with the memories of her last moments on the earth. One of the key elements of immersive theatre is the creation of a carefully designed and detailed environment that immerses the audience in a specific world or setting. Immersive theatre allows us to create a heightened sense of engagement, emotional connection, and agency for the audience. By breaking down the traditional barriers between performer and spectator, it aims to transform the audience's role from a passive observer to an active participant, allowing for a more personalized and unique theatrical experience. It's worth noting that immersive theatre experiences can vary in terms of scale, duration, and level of audience involvement. Some productions, like ours, involve a small, intimate audience, while others can accommodate at the larger groups. It's worth noting that at this performance of Afro Feet, it was staged during the COVID-19 pandemic, so the form offered us, an interesting offered us interesting possibilities um, and during a very challenging time for the theatre. The global health crisis altered our way of living and inevitably our way of making theatre. We performed at her feet in June 2021, in one of the most well-equipped theatres in the country. However, as dictated by the state of emergency, we were pushed to become creative about how we used the space. The production had to be COVID-19 compliant, which meant that the performers, crew members, and the audience members had to wear masks and practice social distancing. Audience members were limited, and at this point, we didn't know if we would ever return to the normal. As, so as theatre makers, we saw this project as a way to dream and figure out what the theatre of this time would look like. Not only that, the production was a teaching production, which means that we had to cast as many students as possible so that they could put the skills that they learn in classes to use in the production process. The original text was performed as a one-woman show. Instead, we cast eight women to play. We had four performers perform the characters Tahira, Aisha, and Karima and Zahra, and the lead character Azra was performed by four performers, the other four performers. Um, all of these performers, um, all of our performers then played um, Azra's mother. Character changes were indicated by a change in the color of their scarf, and the text offered an opportunity. Can we please leave, can we leave those doors open? Is that possible? Um, the text offered an opportunity to deconstruct, demarcate, and designate space and character in a generative way. The audience members and performers were restricted to wearing masks. This was another obstacle that we managed to make work in our favor. One of the clear themes of At Her Feet is the resilience of the colored Muslim women and how they overcame or persevered or adapted their experiences. And that's the same spirit and intention in which the performers played out when we were presented with the obstacle of staging this show. The use of masks as a restriction worked in conjunction with the theme of the play exploring the object, meaning, and representation of the veil. David's portrayal of the veil is then important in breaking the model of women co-opted into being models of complicit passivity. Based on the history of the space, Stellenbosch University, in which the performance took place, <laughs> we can decidedly say that it is a space that purposefully excluded, disallowed, and rejected the presence of people of color. So as a creative team, we began to understand space as something we wanted to reclaim. We then used immersive theatre as a form to travel the audience to places and spaces within the theatre that they would not otherwise occupy. So, side stage, um, things like viewing the performance from the stage, um, or the audience entering from the from the from backstage rather than from where they would traditionally enter. Um, all these things through through these ways, we inverted the gaze of the audience and evoked the idea of occupation as resistance. 
As mentioned above, space became a topic of interest in the creation of the performance, specifically the reclaiming of it. We began with place. Place is a broadly and widely contested topic of interest for theorists, oscillating between oscillating between um, site or location to illustrate different emphasis um, in different disciplines, such as geography, philosophy, the arts, and social science. And we cannot speak to all of them, as this is beyond the scope of this particular presentation. Um, but we do want to understand space as something that is uh, a rich, uh, meaning-making resource. Uh, sorry, I just want to go Um, consequently, space can signal to its occupants whether they belong in it or not. We acknowledge that although there is much about space that cannot be altered, such as the architecture, the language, the history, and, um, these, and these factors influence our feelings of inclusion or exclusion, however, there's much to be altered, uh, or rather created and recreated. The play purpose to use, a, uh, to create a space of belonging and, and meaningful sense-making for students of color at historically white Afrikaans South African institutions. Um, so to conclude, we're going to try something different. Um, I'm going to ask Tiffany a question that I've never heard the answer to this question, and she's going to ask me a similar question. Um, Tiff, can you tell me as a mother, as a sister, not as an academic, um, as a daughter, what was special to you about making this work? Um, coming from the space that I came from, um, Selmash University was a large shock for me. I'm from Johannesburg. And so um, I, up until this point, I had not seen bodies of color on stage or stories mm. of people of color on stage. So I really um, wanted to find and then was lucky enough to be um, the person directing. So even create a space for the students of color to say what they needed to say or to tell stories or to at least have a space that they knew that they could do it, irrespective of the confines of the space around us. And then once we did, there's really something beautiful about women of color working together, um, or in fact just an all-female cast, is that you really begin to bond and create um, almost lifelong relationships that are very deep, and that really allowed us the opportunity to get to know each other. We also went through an incredible period where every during our process, many people had passed on, um, my grandmother being one of them. And so in performing grief, we were also living in it and performing it ourselves in, in many different ways. And it was the most um, life-changing learning experience for me. What do we say? Um, as, a, as an aspiring, hard-working, um, um, on-fire feminist um, and academic, um, what do you find um, that was special, a moment that was special for you in the production process? Um, so yesterday, Linda was, uh, in our session was just talking about how we, we reach for theories as academics, that's what we're taught to do. Um, and I think for me, what was special about this is that, uh, you know, we could theorize, you know, it could be about Azumdua's um, borderlands or, or, or um, Nuttall's entanglements or even, you know, third space theories and all of that. But it's, at the crux of it, we, a group of 10 women, got to grieve together, right? We it, were in a space of, uh, what felt like a, a combative space where we were many of our family members and um, and and colleagues in the theatre industry were really fighting for their lives, um, and and we got to, we got this space, this pause, this place of rest together, um, that was incredibly moving, and I think what then emerges out of that is incredibly deep uh, and and felt uh, visceral, corporal um, relationships with with. With each other that I that I deeply deep, deeply value and, and am affected by to this day. So to conclude, Eve Ensler, an, a feminist activist and playwright, describes the lesson of theatre and performativity as follows: Theatre insists that we inhabit the present tense, not the virtual tense or the politically correct tense. Theatre demands that we truly be where we are. By being there together, we are able to confront the seemingly impossible. We are able to feel that which we fear might destroy us. And we are educated by and transformed by the end. Thank, Thank you. you.
but I am only just I'm going to show just a few slides to you. Um, let me put it in slide mode. Um, okay, uh, because I want um, today I'm talking about um, a part of my PhD which. Um, we're looking at scandal and Gomorrah yeah. and what they say um, <laughs> as telenovelas about our reality. So um, Dina Legaga says something about soapies, right, and their proximity to actual realities mm -hmm. um, and how they use, how they then start to use the moral narrative as a way to script how people should actually live out their daily lives. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to look at today um, through the address, what the address does, how it moves bodies from one place to another, who it legitimizes to be in certain spaces um, and not in other spaces. Um, and we're going to do that by looking at Mali. Um, and at Tati. So Mali is from Scandal, is a character in Scandal, and Tati is, a, is um, the protagonist of Gomorrah, or was, because she left now. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm interested more in women who don't necessarily stand up to or against patriarchal scripts, um, but attempt to survive patriarchy, even as they refuse to follow the very scripts of femininity that give them, well, promise them rather, that survival, right? So um, that's why I name Tati and Bali and the women um, that I interviewed, um, you know, for this project as well, as willful subjects who perform gender and repeat femininity even while they reject the cautionary tales given to them to uphold a respectable femininity, okay? Um, so I want to show, tell you just a little bit about Mbadi um, and the reason I chose this particular picture of her where she's keeping quiet because now um, she's been um, shown to us, presented to us as this very devious character, right, who lies and cheats and does a whole lot of psycho things to get her way uh, and, and to fulfill her own ambitions. So Mbadi um, is from Snake Park. And that's also very important. The fact that in Scandal, um, they generally speak about Soweto, right? And we know that Soweto is a whole lot of different townships. There's Orlando, there's um, Diklu, there, you know, there are a lot of different townships in Soweto, but they just generally talk about Soweto as if it's just this one kind of small place mm -hmm. where Soweto is quite, is, is large, it's the largest township um, in South Africa. But when it came to the story of Mbali and the and and uh, Mbali Sajwayo and her family, they then actually zoned zoomed in to Soweto to find Snake Park, and that's actually very important, right? The way that Snake Park looks, um, its um, reputation um, in the bigger space of what Soweto is, um, the fact that it's supposed to be this place that's completely poverty-stricken and, and so forth is very important. So Bunny's from Snake Park. I'm no longer going to say Snake now. She's from Snake Park. Um, and um, she meets, uh, because she's this ambitious woman and she believes that she does not belong in Snake Park, Snake Park is not going to be the place where she lives and dies, um, she goes on a luxury train um, in hope of finding love. And she does. Um, through Jojo, because she meets Jojo on this luxury train. And what she then tells Jojo when, you know, the part of the day where you say something about yourself and something about Mbali is that she comes from this wealthy family, right? <laughs> Far wealthier than Jojo could ever even imagine, even as wealthy as he is. And um, when they fall in love and decide that they're going to get married, she then goes further with her story and she says her wealthy family is so shocked, so flabbergasted, so ashamed of the fact that she actually went as low as somebody like Jojo, who only lives in Houghton, you know, um, that they are just not coming to the wedding. They decided that they're going to bring up the wedding. So Jojo and the Kubegas live with this shame yeah. that they actually took Mbali out of this luxurious life and she's now downgraded 
made it to <laughs> their little life in Houghton, yeah. right? And that, that then becomes my story um, with Jojo. <laughs> and um, as time goes, um, obviously he then, you know, obviously um, with Soapies, um, who prob um, that, prob uh, that actually problematize uh, people's past, there comes then a time in Sophie's of reckoning, right? And the temporality of Sophie. So um, I'll show you Mali's, I'll show you a small clip of Mali's time of reckoning. <laughs> Um, so this is after um, Mbali, um, Jojo has followed um, Bali's uncle um, home uh, um, because they had even gone as far as elaborately, as this elaborate plan of um, actually hiring a mansion, um, I don't know where, it was probably in Hyde Park or something, but like a huge mansion um, so that Jojo can come and pay Lobola at that mansion, um, yeah, and, but um, because there were bits and, there were cracks in the story and Jojo was starting to see those cracks in the story, he actually followed the uncle home and then he found that Bali stays in Snake Park and that was him confronting them about it and calling Bali a snake, right, and that, yes, and <laughs> yes, she becomes the snake, um, and um, with um, Tati, um, her time of reckoning actually starts at the very beginning of the story because Tati had become accustomed to a life in the suburbs um, where she um, was living with, a very, where she was married to a very rich man and she was living this big life of traveling all around the world you know, shopping leisurely at any time that she wanted. She could get anything she wanted at any time that she wanted. And then when her husband um, was brutally murdered um, during um, a hijacking gone wrong, she found herself um, alone, uh, broke, destitute, and having to move back to Alexandra, right? So um, I want us to see the similarities here between what Alexandra Township represents and what Snake Park um, also represents, right? So Alexandra, again, as this place that is dirty, full of poverty, um, overpopulated, and, and so forth. And that's what she now has to go back to, all right? Um, I'm not going to go, because that's a, a whole other paper. Um, what we learned yesterday is Beck's money. I'm not going to go into that, because there is also a judgment call on both Mbali and Tati about that, the fact that they didn't save away money just in case their change of address changes back to um, what they actually ran away from, right? Yeah. So, um, um, like I said, it's, they frame these stories in a moral narrative so that um, they actually are supposed to teach women um, the things not to do, right? So don't become so ambitious, or rather maybe don't become ambitious at all. Because just, yeah, just that little taste of ambition is what is going to cause you to go and tell people that you come from a rich family, right? Um, when you don't come from a rich family, so that you can get into a rich family, but not stay in the rich family because they're gonna find out your lies. <laughs> it's very complicated, <laughs> right? Um, you were also taught um, about leaving family behind because that's what Tati does in Gomorrah. When she marries um, into this uh, and, and becomes this wealthy, um, well-to-do woman, she actually leaves her family behind, right? So that's another lesson to be learned in the story. Um, but why I call these women willful, even though they are actually playing around with the scripts of patriarchy, um, is because of um, it's because this particular story, even though it comes up in the telenovela as um, as something new, is actually really not new at all, right? So we had obviously um, in a backdate the Dombas, and um, that actually restricted movements, right? Um, Black-bodied movements, um, and. 
we also had then um, the moral narrative of the deviant city woman, mm. right? And um, they say city woman, and they'll say things like, e goli, you must be scared of the women when you get to Goli because they're going to snatch you and um, keep you away from your family forever and ever, right? But when we look at it space-wise and when we look at what the Dompas did, yeah. is that they're actually referring to township women. Right, so there's no the city because uh, black people, according to Abate, did not belong in the city, and so they were moved away into um, the periphery. Right, that is then the township. All right, so that's actually the woman that you're being warned about when you're warned about the city woman in Johannesburg. It's the township woman, um, and. So that restrictive movement then spills over into um, um, 1994. I think the schools were actually, schools were open for, uh, white schools were open for black kids um, in, I think, 1990, right? But by 94, more and more of them were coming. And then there was another restriction as parents were scrambling to put together the money to move their kids to Model C schools from township schools, then they found a new struggle when they got to those schools, and that was, again, the address. Mm. So you had to show your address mm. to them at school. And then, if your address said that you're from the township, they would send you back and say, but then that means that your child should be going to a school in the township. Yeah. So um, our parents, then um, ran around trying to find people with respectable addresses. Um, so they found uncles, they found friends, they found colleagues um, who lived um, closer to these schools that they were trying to get to, and that way, um, that way they got the address so that these kids, um, and their kids can belong to more respectable schools and take on more respectable identities, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's not very different than the woman who hides in the bushes because she's not supposed to be in the city um, when um, the, the police are going to come to check these storm passes to the parents who change their children's addresses so that they can now belong into Model C schools, to these women who then go, no, but I am already from a wealthy family. Um, because then when I speak with my um, participants um, and I ask them, you know, what um, their address does for them, um, especially um, uh, my participants from Alex, is that they, they have, um, most of them have actually changed the addresses on their CVs when applying for jobs. Um, and two of them told me that when it was found out later on, because once you're, you're working, you start to relax, you talk to people, and then it comes out yeah. that, you know, you're like, ah, oh, in Alex, we don't do things like that. And then it's like, oh, she's from Alex. And two of them have actually been asked, after it was found out, to resubmit their CVs. Hey. Um, when it was found out that they're actually from Alex, right? Um, and it was something that I was advised to do as well um, when I was starting to work in corporate for the <coughs> first time um, and I put a CV together. I asked for help for, from people um, who had already been working in corporate. I asked them to look at my CV and tell me what I can improve um, in order to better my chances of getting the job. They said, your CV is fine, everything looks great, you went to a good school, that's going to work for you, but change, change the address. You need to change the address, otherwise they're not going to take you seriously, they're not going to take you as somebody who actually belongs in that space. And so, then we look at, so that brings me then to actually speaking about behavior and choices, right? So it's not just something that women do and that women have. Um, and it goes far beyond these um, narratives of morality, okay? Being um, a femme, being, um, having, embracing a femininity then becomes an unstable place. It's a struggle for recognition and it's a strategy of self-constituting and remembrance, right? So, um, and by, by remembrance, I mean, um, remembering the body to the flesh, that the, those things that become removed from each other. The person 
who she is, what she can offer from the address that she actually lives at, yeah. that actually um, brings down her possibilities um, to, to move forward in life. Okay. Um, so um, then I look at Lauren Berlant, who um, looks at a text, right, and speaks about a woman then who, and I'll quote, learns to seek transformational environments and to accumulate evidence for her goodness within regimes of normative ideology that link intimate desires to political realms of social membership and self-development to the assimilation of bourgeoisie norms. So what um, Laura, um, Lauren Berlant speaks about here is, is these repetitions of femininity, mm -hmm. right? Because if gender is this unstable place and femininity is never quite complete, um, what, how you maintain gender and how you maintain femininity is by constantly repeating it. Yeah. You have to keep acting it out, right? And how you then get to a respectable femininity is by taking on identities that should already exist for a respectable femininity and repeating that cycle over and over and over again as Tati and Mbali do mm -hmm. and as my participants do by changing the address. Because by changing the address, you're not, it, it doesn't just stop on paper. There's certain mannerisms yeah. that are expected of you, right? You're supposed to present yourself in certain ways. You're supposed to have a certain accent, right? So, um, so um, Lauren Berlant also then speaks about the chasing of an object in order to receive this respectable femininity, right? And um, how the love object and how the way that the love object views you and sees you then becomes your identity. So it's quite um, literal then if we're going to talk about Jojo, right, and Bali, and the way that Jojo perceives Bali becomes who Bali is, yeah. right? And now she's no longer Bali from Snake Park, she's Lady M, right, <laughs> from the Kubega family, and she deserves all of the best things in life, yeah. right? Um, and your love object then, even if it's in the form of a job or a better life or of moving from one place to the other. Oh, um, I've still got, I think, one minute, so I can give one more example um, mm -hmm. of um, my participants who changed the, their addresses even for men um, that they were going into relationships with, right? So um, when a guy drops you off, hey. he doesn't drop you off inside of Alex, he drops you off in the surrounding suburbs. Somewhere yeah. by the surrounding suburbs, right? Yeah, because then you can walk. It's still within walking distance, right? Yeah, so that's again how this chasing of a love object becomes the identity that, that you then take on and that you start to perform. Yeah. So changing of address is not a deviant thing. Mm -hmm. I want to say it's a willful thing, right? Mm -hmm. But it also still conforms to the very scripts of what um, patri um, patriarchal capitalism tells people to be, mm -hmm. right? And tells them how to act and who to be in order to deserve a certain kind of life. And that's what we see through Bali and Tech. I'll stop it. My paper is titled Perceptions of the Unfaithful Lover and Invulnerability in the Storybook Blog. The paper specifically examines the ways in which representations, interpretations of vulnerability, infidelity, identities, and experiences of shame in contemporary digital short fiction. I'm particularly focusing on a blog that is no longer existing because of the ephemeral nature that Dina Ligardo was talking about of these spaces, in which you find that some of the writers that use these spaces they want to shift when they get success. So when they start, it's experimental. They don't care who gets to read. But when they gain success, they don't want people to see their mistakes when they started. So this is the blog that I'm using. 
So it had started in 2012, and then it disappeared. And what's interesting about these blogs is that they reappear in other formats, or the stories that they write, they might end up being novels. And the tagline that they used when they started was sort of like a, um, an anti-establishment, that they wanted to protest against the, uh, the, print of, uh, the print establishment, in which most of the times when they would write their manuscripts, they would be turned down. So when they published, um, and they gained recognition, they didn't want now their work to be their head, given their audience to be seen. So this paper conducted a close reading of Nolita and the Frost, 2013 story, Beloved, Leroy and Clover's uh, Death and Darwin's and the Death on Wheels. And in these selected short stories, I have used agendic constructions of infidelity in order to look at their intertextual manner and examine multiple narratives and how they address the notion of infidelity and vulnerability from a gender perspective. Why I chose this story is because you find that in the first story by, uh, by Nolita and Frost, it is conversational. You find that she is writing her experience of infidelity and acknowledging her mistakes from a woman perspective. And then you find in the other story, death, there is uh, now a perspective of a man in the same relationship with uh, the character in Nolita and Frost from a male perspective. And that gives a balanced assessment of how they perceive the same act differently. So I want to uncover the deeper meanings that are attached to the notions of infidelity and invulnerability in heterosexual relationships. Societal norms and stereotypes uh, foster a deeper understanding of the intricate relationship that we find in Zimbabwean popular digital short fiction. Such an exploration, when you look at it, creates uh, certain dynamics. For instance, I look at it from a boy meets girl paradigm and vice versa, in which you see how the perceptions are nuanced. In Leroy's story, Death, it revolves around a character called Victor, who is struggling with addiction. And when he finally gets over his addiction, he meets this lovely woman in the library, and he describes his life as a steaming pile of shit. In an emotive trail of thoughts, Victor told that it's said that my narratives comes at a time when I feel as though I'm about to lose my mind. And then, with the confessional tone, the story then changes. And then, we find that Victor is now inspired. He now looks forward to life when he meets Tandil. And this journey that he has alters the course of the relationship. And then, Victor, when he's got smart, when he sees uh, Tandil, he's conjured and enchanted with the look of Tandil. Victor also breaks. What they had is what novels called a whirlwind romance. This romantic trope, often celebrated in popular culture and art, captures the intensity and euphoria that can accompany the discovery of a soulmate. What's interesting is that the descriptions that are used when he sees a perceived tangible, that's what I'm very interested in. He describes tangible as both pretty and small employing a rhetorical pause <coughs> to emphasize each characteristic. This deliberate punctuation, choice, and choice adds a sense of contemplation and appreciation to the description highlighting the narrator's admiration of her physical appearance. The detailed observation and the careful selection of this descriptive language uh, create a sense of intrigue and fascination. <coughs> I argue that the concept of love at first sight can be understood as a manifestation of the patriarchal gaze, which reduces women to mere objects of male desire. When someone experiences love at first sight, they're often captivated by the physical appearance, and then they don't get to see the person for who she is. They're focusing on the beauty, the charm, and the charisma. And these <coughs> ideas, they of the perpetuate ideals of patriarchy. In this sense, patriarchal gazing reinforces uh, the notions of hegemonic masculinities 
in a way that the way women are treated because as a result of how they are perceived. It's important to critically analyze this, taking into consideration of what Melissa Stein and Mick Van Zyl talk in their book, The Prize and the Price, that they observe the design, the desire, in which you look at how the men who are supposed to be able-bodied, who are supposed to be virile, young, or who are supposed to be able-bodied, virile, and of good social standing, is, has to be merged with a woman who is supposed to be young and who has the idea <coughs> or willingness to be married. So in this context, you see how the notions of infidelity are gendered in the way that women are not given or ashamed when they are caught red-handed as opposed to men who are given a license mm -hmm. that they should continue being unfaithful and it's regarded as the most prized characteristic of a man. Victor then observes, this woman was simply captivating. She wore those skinny jeans that everyone is obsessed with this, with this these days. They had their legs so tightly. I hope they would rip open, but they did not. Black skinny jeans and a black t-shirt that bore the legend, you can call me bitch like it's a bad thing. I couldn't see much of her face because she wore a khaki sandal. Yes, it was a body that drew my attention. Small as she was, something about her just said, do not fuck with me. I've been around the block. And of course, there was the t-shirt. The t-shirt just screamed character. For the first time in my life, I was tongue tied. Victor's fascination with Tanduis appearance highlights the role of visual cues in shaping perceptions of others and how they leave lasting impression in the men's sight. This objectification ties in with the socio-literary analysis that has been made by Ruka Zanwa in her book, Images of Women in Zimbabwean Literature, which examines the objectification and eroticization of the female body, shedding light on the predominantly negative stereotypes of women in Zimbabwean literary text. However, what is interesting is that Victor gets to find Tanjiwe in an uncompromising position with the neighbor, Mr. Nyati. And as a result, he then, he then beats Mr. Nyati and then storms out and then he's arrested. And you find that there's this lack of addressing of emotions in these mas uh, masculinities that are being represented in this blog, in which they commit suicide as a result of infidelity because they feel betrayed, whether it's in a cohabiting relationship or it's a marriage situation. So when you look at the anger, the unresolved anger that is in uh, men, when they, they look at their counterparts as possessed objects, as trophy wives, that they should behave in a certain manner and they should remain monogamous while they are free to do as, as, as they please. So the consequences of infidelity are designed to be different and the punishment that comes with when one is caught is also different. And when you now look at the different paradigm of girl meets boy, it's now different because we now see now how Nolutando in her book Beloved now shapes the differences in terms of how he never talks of Victor's body, and how he never talks of um, what he could, um, what she could achieve in the relationship, but focus of I only needed a place to stay, and this ties in with what Dina Ligabe talks of the good time girl, as she had mentioned that she had been uh, a good time, uh, she had been around the block for some time. So she asserts that moving in with the Victor was an inevitable outcome, a sense of resignation or acceptance. At first glance, this could imply a lack of agency or control in decision making, but Tandua establishes that she was sexually liberated. And Beloved opens with this line, they called me a slow. You won't find that word in the Oxford Dictionary of English. In case you don't know, a slow is about the filthiest name you can call any woman. It's an amalgamation of two more popular names for women of supposedly loose morals. 
She doesn't give you the definition, she doesn't give the definition of what slow means, but she hints on that it means how slut shaming and how women are treated as wars in uh, Zimbabwean patriarchal society. Tanya does not shy away from detailing her sexual experiences, and Victor knows this, and continues to say he wants to marry her. But as a result, when he finds out that she's having an affair, she then blames herself that I wish I could have told Victor that he should stop treating me like a China dog. He should stop treating me like I'm fragile. He needs to know that I can take it. That's why I was tempted to go to Mr. Nyati, the neighbor. So when you look at that, you see that there's a notion. There's a notion of silence in which in African society, Sometimes women shy away from telling their men that they're bad in bed. <laughs> and this is captured by Stephen Newell when he argues that there's a pattern or formula to the way sexually self determined female characters who are sexually liberated are depicted in popular literature as misusing their sexuality. Audrey Lord, similarly, uses the erotic, in the uses of the erotic and the erotic as power, emphasizes that the erotic as a source of power and urgency for women in marginalized communities can be able to make them have an identity and to reclaim it whenever they need and used as a site of expression and liberation. Mm -hmm. So when you look at how she views the reason why she is living, uh, and looking outside, bed hopping, is because as much as she loves Victor, she still wants to be sexually satisfied. Mm -hmm. And when she cannot get it, she cannot tell him. She mm -hmm. just go out and look for uh, what pleases her. And that shows that she is sexually liberated. <laughs> so this example of infidelity from Lelutanus Frost shows the nuances and dynamic in how women are treated as a result when they are caught. But what's interesting is what happens when, uh, she, when she now finishes the story. She then says, all the time, when I would sleep with Ms. Tignati, I would use a phone, which speaks of an urgency. And then she'd also say that, as much as you see me as being reckless, I was in pursuit of my sexual freedom. Hey, come on. And then she goes on to, to highlight that I got to know that I'm HIV positive. And who do you think is responsible? Mm -hmm. the, the society will say I'm the one who got yeah. HIV. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we find that people always treat Victor as the victim. Mm -hmm. And he lives to the stereotype of the victim when yeah. he commits suicide. Mm -hmm. And he gets to die without knowing um, that um, that Tanju is pregnant. Because he commits himself because he's HIV positive. So this ties in also with what K. Michelle says when he talks of gendering or shame in contemporary literature. That men's shame is still frequently displaced onto female bodies, mm. while women's shame is seen to dishonor the men with whom they are connected, whose property they are assumed to be. An analysis of gendered constructions of infidelity through the boy meets girl and girl meets boy paradigm, we gain insights onto the diverse experiences, motivations, and societal pressures that contribute to our understanding of perceptions of infidelity. From a critical standpoint, okay, the passage reveals that the significance of open and honest communication relationships is what uh, is lacking. Then I'll quickly want to look at the other story that I'm focusing. So we have, in, in death, we have Ketani, who is a uh, community omnibus driver, who is, in a, who is chased out of his matrimonial home because of infidelity, and he leaves his wife and stays with uh, his girlfriend, who happens to be a commercial sex worker. 
And when he, uh, the wife, when she follows the husband and says, you should come back home, the child misses you, he's now having pride and saying, I'm not coming, I'm enjoying where I'm staying. But at the same time, he doesn't want to marry Tracy, whom he's staying with. Because he says, every time I'm, I'm inconvenienced when she's having hair regulars, I have to go and sleep at her lodge. And when you look at this, you see the dynamic in which that Tracy wants now to be committed. She wants to leave her commercial sex work, but she cannot leave until her promise of being married is guaranteed. Yeah. And Ketan is not showing that. Mm. And he enjoys it. And you see that um, what he says in this quote, I'll, I'll, I'll read fast. He says, uh, so there's an incident in which uh, the wife comes and then they fight. And she's very disappointed that uh, they are fighting in her house. And that's very dis disrespectful. And instead of Ketan holding her, he's holding the wife. And this ties in with the notion of respectability and unrespectability in terms of women. And then he says, Ketan, I'm not all supposed to be emotionally disabled. Okay, maybe I shouldn't say this about him. She loves me or so, she says. I'm sorry, sweet tribe. You know I love you. I didn't mean what I said. How do I know cats? To you, I'm just a whore. You fuck whenever you want to. I thought I would someday be your wife. We both keep quiet. I have no answer for that. She will never be my wife. But I love it, or maybe I love sleeping with her. It's hard to differentiate between love and lust. Mm -hmm. So when you see this, you realize that there's that continuation of objectification of women and how there's a lack in terms of, uh, there's an emotional disconnect with the men when how they look at uh, women. So this also um, explains the idealized union as and the idealized union as having a woman who's monogamous. As much as Ketan is, is no longer in a relationship with his wife, she's still the ideal wife, and Tracy can never be seen as such. In conclusion, examining constructions of gender infidelity, of infidelity and vulnerability prompts a re-evaluation of traditional gender roles. And we also need to consider relationships that do not fit or in, under the narrow definitions of heteronormative order. Thank you. Yes. I'm sorry, Dumi, uh, to finish like I missed yours. Um, my first question is for you, Dumi. Um, I like this term you use, repetitions of femininity. And I just wondered if, uh, in terms of your participants, is there a, a, a dominant kind of respectable womanhood or femininity that they're aspiring for? Um, you know, the one that we see in the, in the covers of Destiny magazine, True Love, is that still the femininity that they aspire for, or is it different femininities? Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of the um, telenovela, it's, it's frightening to me. I'm, I'm, so I'm wondering in terms of Scandal and Gomorrah, are there shifts? So if I look at Tabeja, for instance, it's, it's striking to me that the women want the good life, mm -hmm. but if we compare them to the generation of generation women, mm -hmm. they wanted the good life, but they were CEOs. Yeah. They, were, yes. they, they are yeah. women who worked. Yeah. Yeah. So what is striking to me is that when I watch Tabeh, I can't tell if it's Monday or Saturday. Is that a shift that we see in mm -hmm. terms of yeah. the, the, the femininity that we, we aspire for, actually? Maybe it's not to be a CEO, it is to be on a perpetual holiday. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what, what is happening. Mm -hmm. um, and then for, for Kudzai, I sort of wonder, do we know in the, no, in, in the novel if Mr. Nyati's sex was good? Um, <laughs> um, 
and then you say that you know there's a lack of addressing the emotions of the man. I mean, at, um, which is why then is it Victor who who commits suicide. Mm -hmm. Are there sites of where men can be vulnerable mm -hmm. in any way in the novel? You know, it's something I think about in terms of sort of public and private spaces of um, male vulnerability. Because it, it's almost like either you are in the church or you are in the bar. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, 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 it's somewhere in the place. <coughs> because then I wonder, you know, she goes to Mr. Nyati. I mean, so even if she did tell him that he was not good in bed, would he have been able to hear her? Yeah. Is what I wonder. Yeah. Thanks. Hey. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for the amazing panel and great discussion. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, so my, um, uh, uh, my notes. So my, okay, like, I think I don't know. Maybe let's start with um, the two doomies. Um, so do me, I think do me. Oh, uh, Which one? <laughs> Gomorrah. Gomorrah. <laughs> um, it's very interesting that you were talking about addresses and how people um, change their addresses in order to have access to spaces. Um, and it's, I never thought about that really, but it's actually a practice that still happens till today in majority townships where if you want your child to go to a school in CBD, you would get someone who has an address close to there, you know? And it's actually even extended to hospitals now mm. um, in major cities where, you know, it's just to have good health care, you have to change your address. So I wanted to ask, and I think maybe to link your point to what the other Dubi said in her presentation, she was speaking about um, occupation as resistance and how, you know, to take up space whether you belong there or not, um, and how sometimes you can't change the architecture and the history of it, but you can take up the space nonetheless, right? So I was thinking with you and the Gomorra, the two lovely ladies who are amazing, can't we perhaps think of them trying to take up those spaces and occupying those spaces as resistance? Because um, they, I'm pretty sure they go through like a, Physically, emotionally, and mentally, they probably go through a lot of preparation waking up every day. And they're like, oh, okay, I have to wake up in this beautiful life and pretend to this English the whole day. You know, there's probably like psychological things that you have to, um, what do you call it? I think Prof. Kuala this morning called it, ah, you see, this is what I was trying to say. Um, like the body is memory making. So there's probably like a lot of things you have to do every day to pretend this a lifestyle and that you've never had before. So it's perpetual training. So I was wondering, can't we think of them trying to occupy those spaces as um, a sort of resistance? And I think with um, Prof. Magatha's question to Kudzi, Kudzai, um, where you were saying, is there a site for men to be vulnerable? I was trying to think with regards to the woman that the man did not want to marry because of her sexual, sexual, you said sexual job? Commercial Com sex. Commercial sex. Mm. Um, job, sex. Work. Was he, was she perhaps his place of vulnerability? Because I sometimes feel that men never, I mean, well, that my, I don't know, <laughs> but correct me if I'm wrong, that they're willing to be vulnerable in sites and spaces they don't keep forever. Ish. And they can just dispose of when they die. Exactly. Sorry, I'm just asking you. <laughs> it's that question. months yeah. of, of, of becoming a lecturer. Um, so when you also think age-wise, I'm not actually very far from my uh, from the students. So I think in that way, um, it was, uh, it, I kind of immediately arrived at a place of, um, uh, not compromise, but I don't know. Um, 
uh, where emotional labor I knew was kind of going to be part of the job description, also being the only black lecturer on the staff. Um, also, yeah. <laughs> um, also had opened up a very particular thing. So uh, immediately, um, even at the sight of me um, in the space, there were there is an openness that um, and and almost an unraveling in in some ways that 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 uh, in, in both students and I go through, um, which which is an interesting thing to navigate. But I think um, as is ethically the right word, um, for me it, it had to remain a space for the students. Um, and I think that's why co-direction helped so much because I did have a peer that I could then um, do the work of sense making and, um, and, um, and, and a debriefing with. Um, so that's kind of how it was, um, yeah, how we managed to get uh, through it. Uh, yeah. Um, so I'm not a lecturer actually, um, I'm, I, I run the Adam Small Theatre Complex and so I, uh, in the structure of Stellenbosch University the academic staff members are called C1 staff members and then the staff members that are technical or admin or whatever are called C2 staff members and then the staff members that are cleaners are called C3. So I fall into the C2 staff members. And um, we were hired similarly around the same time, um, in the same year, and both the drama department's very first um, people of color and then women of color at the same time. So there's a, there's a strategic move here, there's a, a sense of understanding from ourselves that we were, it, it first, you know, initially it feels like a breaking of boundaries, but then very quickly you <laughs> recognize that you are a token, yeah. and it's a very difficult um, space to navigate, and so you're constant, we're, con we're till today I would like to think, we're constantly um, deciding how to deal with the space. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, when going into this directing process, we find, like I found very much that, um, firstly, the co-directing, super, super helpful, because to me, I suppose, experiences them before in class and then in rehearsals, and then the next day in class again, so obviously she gets to see how that happens. Whereas with me, it's different because um, I don't teach them. So when they see me, they actually developed a relationship with me that caused my office to become a safe space. Um, so I had, initially it was just the cast of At Her Feet, the girls who would come in and complain about the difficulty they're experiencing or how they have a paper and just tied it and regular student stuff. And then sometimes, um, and then more, more and more often it became, um, you know, uh, this lecturer spoke Afrikaans the entire lesson and when I asked them not to, they didn't, you know, they didn't listen. And then asking for advice from me, who didn't grow up in that, who didn't, who didn't and study in that space, studied at Bird, so it's, Afrikaans wasn't my fight. And now suddenly, <laughs> now suddenly it's my fight. Now I'm trying to make sense of, of, of that thing. So uh, I think the amount of layers that we're negotiating on was just so much that we couldn't afford to go into the space as, um, lecturers, students, or directors, you know, it had to be a collaborative experience. Um, but also based on the history of the way things were made in at Stanmarsh University through the drama department, they had never seen work like ours. Um, they'd never done a workshop process, they've never, so, um, and also yes, I, I'd really like to celebrate that it's something uh, big and new, but uh, that's a very hard space to navigate because our colleagues don't, they don't come and watch that. They don't support it. They don't get it. And so we're we, we're fighting our own battles here, which really helps that we're a, we're a team um, and a damn good team, if I have to say so yeah. myself. Um, no, we really we we're so good for each other's minds. But then at the same time, being able to level out um, as emotional women who feel and the theatre makers. So we're feeling and we're moving and then needing to navigate our personal and professional spaces, and then also connecting with these students on a deeper level um, actually made it easier to work with them. It makes it easier to crit them if I see them in something else because they come and ask, so what did you think? Then it's, it's not so hard to say, that was really bad or you didn't try or those movements were lazy or because um, then they want to work harder, they want to push more and I think the lack 
it just goes back to all the things we always talk about, but the lack of representation of something. Um, th these, these girls are finally seeing something they've never seen before. Um, women in positions that they've never seen before. So for them, it, it very much became like a, whoa, oh my gosh, um, we can do that. I want to I want to be a theater maker. Because before we got there, or at least the initial conversations I'd had with them was like, maybe I'm going to go into teaching, maybe I'm going to do journalism after this degree, maybe, because for them they couldn't find a place where they could sit, and now suddenly there were people occupying that space. Sure. Yeah. Oh, okay, I guess I'm going next. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your questions. Um, and I'll start um, with dominant femininities. Um, I think the femininities are, are very interesting in that way that um, there isn't anything um, that's sort of dominant so and and I'll answer it together so yes there has been a shift in times right um, because um, even within the telenovela you're not going to find just one kind um, of femininity or one kind of aspiration right so you also find um, characters like Dinkle um, who um, started off as uh, she she changed everything she she anything that she could change she she changed right yeah. but then she finally got to a point where um, she's now CEO of a production company and you know now she's the she's the working girl who's 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 doing her own life and in her own way um, so um, then when it comes to my participants then um, that also differs in the kinds of femininities that they chase after or that they try to keep repeating. So um, that I've, I've interviewed um, women who are very career driven um, and ambitious in that sense. Um, I've, I've interviewed, yeah, from women who are very career driven and um, um, amb ambitious um, all the way to um, women who are just off of drugs and single mothers. Um, so it, so it, it really varies. And what they then aspire to becomes different um, depending on the positions that they already find themselves in, mm -hmm. right? So the position becomes the springboard or the starting point of, okay, this is where I need to move to, this is what I need to be, this is how I can achieve um, this particular thing in my life, right? Um, so even with the kinds of jobs, obviously, that people will apply for depends on where you are yeah. already at. Yeah. Um, and that's another thing about, about repetitions that interests me so much, that, you, that in order for it in order for the next step to happen, um, step zero even has to be done over and over and over again in order to get there, right? Um, and um, working women versus women who live a life of novelty is a change also in the times um, and not just necessarily within the telenovela because the telenovela, like I said, um, uh, in, in a very dramatic way, actually mirrors what's already happening in society, right? Um, so uh, at that time, yes, um, we were all trying to be Karabo um, Moroccan. I was never trying to be Karabo Moroccan. I like to be much better. <laughs> yeah, but at the end of the day, they were hardworking women, you know, who were good at their craft and, um, and, and, at that time, that's the woman that was being presented to us, but it was also the woman of the of the new democracy, yeah. 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 right? Um, it was the woman of um, Tabo Beki's um, re, um, African Renaissance mm -hmm. that, that we were looking at in yeah. telenovelas at that time. Yeah. And right now, um, we are more focused on... Um, well, we're not focused on it. It's that um, um, capitalism is constantly failing us. So how we then start to repeat femininities in this failing capitalism also has to change, right? So that you realize that you're not going to become an Zigi or a Karabo Moroga because those spaces are already not open to you. And I'll get yeah. to that resisting um, to enter into spaces. That, they, that you're not going to make 
your career that big. You may have a career, but it's not going to be that big. And what other avenues are there then to follow in order to still live um, the, the capitalist dream, sure. right? And then um, the soft life, as Lebohan Masango puts it, becomes that way to actually live out that femininity, mm -hmm. right? And the changing of address then is also an avenue through which you can actually start to live out that particular femininity um, where um, your, the objects that you worship um, become a part of your identity. So it, it never looks like you are worshipping those objects, but that those objects were always a part of who you are and who you are going to continue to be, right? Um, and is it resistance? Um, I would say that there is resistance in it, right? But I think um, more than just resisting what spaces are closed to me and what spaces are not, and, 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 and it is, that is a constant chase, and that's something that is going to keep going, and it's something that I encourage, actually. You know, um, obviously, um, we get, okay, I'll make this point, and then I'll get again to resistances. We get to a point we reach a point in our lives as women, um, as township women, where we can start, we can drop the act, right? So as, as I have, right? So now I can, I'm in a position now where I can proudly tell you that I'm from Alex. And I don't care how you look at me. I don't care how you, what you associate Alex with that I shouldn't be associated with. And you, you know, like we're not debating about it. I'm not hiding it. I'm, I'm in that position now. And there are women who simply are not in that position. And there are women who will maybe even get to a point of power and maybe I shouldn't, okay, I should not mention names because I don't know what, yeah. But um, you know, certain models uh, okay, and I'll mention the name of the person who is in that position. Um, um, oh gosh, the chef, now I'm forgetting her name. Lona Maseko, yes, Lona Maseko got to that position where she could say, I'm from Alex, that's where I was born. But when she was starting her career in ballet and then in television, she couldn't really be that outright about it, right? And then there's some people who are in the modeling industry who are still not coming out with where actually where they actually grew up. So is it resistance? Yes, yes, but, right? Um, because um, at the end of the day, they, it's like I said, that you are still repeating and you are still taking you are still taking the scripts that are given by, um, by um, heteropatriarchy and capitalism, right? So you're still navigating those spaces. You're not trying to get out of those spaces. You're navigating it um, as a way to survive, right? But what is resisted in that um, itching of, of, of survival and that need to survive is the cautionary tale. So the thing you're told not to do um, the thing that these women are told not to do is the thing that they do because they realize that in order to survive this and in order to reach the respectable femininity that I aspire to, I'm going to have to do away with this. Oh, be proud of who you are. No, I'm not proud of who I am. I'm proud of the person that I am going to be. Right? Yeah, so. <laughs> So thank you for the questions. Um, the first one, sites of public and uh, private uh, briefing and uh, vulnerability. So if I let in the stories, uh, because they're short stories, so I only selected the ones that tackle infidelity and vulnerability. But um, if we look at them as a block, you'd see how they're intertextual and the thread, how it continues. You'll find that um, what is missing from the stories that I'm looking at is the information that Victor's mother had passed away. And to grow up, she was, uh, the mother was a single mother, and um, the father had just impregnated her and left. And then that's his upbringing, and when he now has a friend in high school, um, he gets to have that self-actualization, realize his love for creativity and writing. And then the problem is, 
the friend marries. And then the loneliness comes back again, and he now takes to alcohol. And then when he takes to alcohol, he then finds this woman, when he's now a recovering addict. And then when he's a recovering addict, so I think also because Tandre knew, so I don't think also you know, he'll be able to, should be able to tell if this is the case. And uh, in all, all the men in the stories, they always use alcohol as a coping mechanism. And the extreme case is suicide. And um, that's what happened in, in, in most of the stories. And when you look at the second question, uh, I don't think so, because they are obsessed. Because he's obsessed. Um, in, in the story, we find that he would leave work early because he misses it. He wants to go home to his woman. And you see it, isn't it? And also, the other thing is, um, in, 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 in Zimbabwean context, cohabiting is seen as an unofficial marriage and is treated as a full marriage. So when you pregnant someone, like if I'm pregnant someone, my parents would say, even if I'm in a relationship with someone I want to marry, they say, this is the one you should marry because she's pregnant. So in this case, she was not pregnant. He didn't know she's pregnant, but he would see her as his wife. The way you'd address the woman is different with how Ketani addresses um, Tracy. And then when we talked of, uh, I think, third question, place of vulnerability. Uh, thank you for that. I, I didn't look at it from that point. I had looked at it from the point of that he's still vulnerable to his wife in as much as he doesn't uh, say it out loud. Because the way when they are fighting, the wife is actually beating Tracy. But he is the one who holds the wife and then speaks to her in a charming way to stop, which shows that he still wants to be with his wife, but at the same time, he still wants to have a promiscuous relationship with other women. So there's that aspect of, you can take me back only if you allow me to be this, of which she will not. So I think that's how I looked at it, but I also consider your point. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I was just